Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Pacwa, and welcome to Threshold of Hope, where we take a look at the writings of the church. We are continuing on in our study of uh, Veritatis Splendor, which means the splendor of truth. You can get uh, a, a paperback copy of this encyclical from EWTN's religious catalog. You either go online, EWTNRC.com, or you can call, uh, if you're in North America, 1-800-854-6377. Another option is to download a free electronic copy of Veritatis Splendor by going to our main website, ew10.com. See at the top, Libraries, click that. Then you'll see Document Library, click that. Type in Veritatis Splendor, and they'll give you that uh, document. And you can download it for free into your computer and read along with us from the computer or print it out but you've got to pay for that yourself, your own paper. Now, of course, we'd love to have you involved and participate in the show. Uh, the live show is, of course, on Tuesdays at 2 p.m. And you can do what these nice people have done, coming from all different parts of the United States, right here to beautiful Irondale, Alabama, right next door to Birmingham. Another option is you can send a question by writing to threshold at EWTN.com. Or you can call us during the live broadcast on Tuesday at 2 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time. Uh, the phone number in North America is 1-800-221-9460. If you're outside North America or inside Birmingham, you can call 205 271 2980, and the country code is 1, because we invented the phone in America. All right, we are now on paragraph 39. This, again, is a section that is uh, guided by the verse from the book of Sirach, chapter 15, verse 14 where Sirach wrote back around 190 B.C. It was he who created man in the beginning, and he left him in the power of his own inclination. So, Scripture teaches us that God gave us a great deal of responsibility. And we're going to continue on with that. In paragraph 39, it says, It's not only that God left us in a, to have a great responsibility in the world at large, so that in the world we can do science, technology, we can invent things. We don't just live off of whatever happens to grow up, but we can plant crops and harvest them and store them. And we do all sorts of things in the world. but. Also, in regard to human beings themselves, that we see God, uh, God has entrusted humans to their own care and responsibility. So that it would be incorrect to think that God is going to be there at every single step and make sure that nobody hurts themselves and nothing bad goes wrong and you know, everything is just fine and perfect. No, the Lord put us here and gives us a great deal of responsibility about how we live in the world. And <clears throat> that's something that is uh, very important in the modern world because there are many more people than there used to be. And we have a very large impact on the world because our technology is so vast. And there are a lot of good things that come from our technology, but also a lot of problems. So that, you know, where I grew up in Chicago, uh, one of the problems was we did not treat 
uh, the sewage from the city and we just dumped it in the river. And that was problematic because the river flowed into the lake, which is our drinking water. Now that is dumb, dumb. And so in, and in Chicago is one of those places where you can fix anything from a judge to a ticket to a river. And at least in the old days, I'm sure you don't have anything like that going on anymore. But it, they fixed the river by making it flow the other direction so that all of that raw sewage would go right down to Memphis and not affect us. <laughs> and, but, but even that wasn't right, obviously. So now they've, you know, we, we take more responsibility and they clean up the sewage and they process it. And they don't just dump raw sewage into the river to send down to those poor people in Memphis. And instead, it uh, you know, is processed. And amazingly, when I was a kid, if you happened to fall into the river, you immediately had to go get tetanus shots. That was the norm. There's a gentleman from Chicago who remembers the old days. And the, um, now, people fish in the river. And they don't come out with three eyes. That's pretty good. And also, people swim in the river. Unheard of when I was growing up. Again, human beings have a responsibility not to mess up the environment and to take care of it and many other things in the world. That's a good thing. That's why the, the Pope wrote that encyclical on the environment. We have those kinds of responsibilities. And again, the Pope cites that verse from Sirach 15, verse 14, that God left man in the power of his own counsel. God gives us the ability to think, um, do you really like the idea of dumping your sewage in the river and then having it go into your drinking water? Do you think that's a good idea? I mean, he doesn't, he doesn't just sort of come in there and, and smash everybody with lightning because they were putting sewage in Lake Michigan. He let them Take a look at here's the consequences of your behavior and either you fix this or you're going to get uh, various diseases like typhus and so other diseases that come from drinking polluted water that you polluted. And this is so clean it up. You make a mess. Now see, wait a minute. Is my mother here? If you make a mess, clean it up yourself. You know, that's one of the things that you know, God has that mentality leaving us in charge. And at the same time, he leaves us in the power of God's, uh, of our own counsel, so that by our own abilities, we may seek God, the creator. That's why you see in a lot of philosophy courses, that the title is, uh, you know, philosophy of man. And sometimes you'll see it's philosophy of man's search for meaning. What is the purpose of life? Now, a lot of people, of course, try to avoid that kind of question. And they try to fill their life with all sorts of things and noises to quiet it down. I was listening to Catholic radio earlier this morning. And there was a man who said, I have a friend who goes to the movie every night because he's trying to drown out the meaninglessness of life. God doesn't want you to drown out the meaninglessness of your life. He wants you to seek more deeply to find him so that you can find the purpose and the meaning of your life. It's not meaningless unless you depend only on your puny little self. But if you go ahead and expand beyond the smallness of your little mind, you can find that there's a vast meaning of life. But you have to take the initiative to search. And that the goal is to freely attain perfection. 
not forced to do it by somebody else, but to seek perfection of your character, to smooth out the negative qualities that everybody has, and to highlight the good qualities everybody has, and to take the virtues and bring them to a kind of harmony, or my favorite word is bring them to integrity, where you hold them together in a balance and integrate all the virtues so that one virtue does not wipe out some of the others. That's integrity, as you hold the whole of your personality together. And that's building up the perfection inside a person. Indeed, just as people in exercising dominion over the world shape the world in accordance with their own intelligence and will, again, think of uh, even the days from the 60s, when I was a teenager, that there were still enormous areas of starvation in the world. Today, it, there, there's actually way more food than people can eat. There's no need for famine anymore. You have politicians messing things up and interfering in commerce and economy so that food doesn't get to those that need it. Somalia is a classic example, one of the poorest, if not the poorest country in the world. Most of the poverty is because the various fighting gangs won't let food get to the other parts of that there are their enemy gangs and they prevent each other from getting food. That's political chaos causing hunger. But there's plenty of food everywhere. India was starving. China was starving back in the 60s. And it's not that long ago, but today there's plenty of food. Human beings can shape the, uh, our dominion over the world according to our intelligence and will. Likewise, when we perform morally good actions, people strengthen themselves. They develop and consolidate the likeness to God by doing what is morally good. Some people want to be in the image and likeness of God by having power. And oftentimes they do so in order to abuse that power by keeping other people under their thumb. Again, Somalia and many other places that are dictatorships. But the goal is not to be like God and having power so you can put people on your thumb. God wants to give us freedom to act morally. And when we act morally, that is when we are acting like God in His image and in His likeness in the most poignant way. That is the goal of being human. Now the Vatican Council warned against a false concept of autonomy. Now, you can be autonomous, but you can have a dumb idea of autonomy. Thinking, you know, uh, I, I, I know people who, uh, yeah, their life is difficult and they feel great pain, but sometimes then they say, well, I want to commit suicide. No, that's, you don't have the autonomy. You did not make yourself get conceived. You did not make yourself get born. You didn't get born on your own power. There are a lot of other people helping, and especially your mother and your father. And so you're not autonomous completely. All of us have an inherent dependence on other people and ultimately dependence on God. So we don't want to have a false concept of the autonomy of earthly realities. Because as it says in Gaudium et Spes, paragraph 36, if the expression, the independence of temporal affairs is taken to mean that created things do not depend on God, and that man can use all the created things without any reference to their creator, 
anyone who acknowledges God will see how false such a meaning is. Again, you know, the, it was a Catholic priest from Belgium who came up with the Big Bang Theory. And as anybody knows who has ever set off an explosion, big or small, it, whether you uh, have been in the military and you sent a bomb, or whether you're a kid who blew up uh, fireworks, you know that when you have an explosion, it usually does not end up with greater order. <laughs> no, we send bombs against enemies to cause disorder and destruction. The Big Bang is an explosion of pure light, and from it comes everything. Everything exists. Who could make such an explosion? Again, anybody who makes explosions knows that you don't, that they don't usually go off by themselves. Some other force causes things to explode. You drop a bomb, you set fire to a firecracker, whatever it might be. But something causes the explosion to happen. Explosions don't happen by themselves. They remain inert or there's some heat or other force that comes upon them that shakes nitroglycerin or whatever else it might be. And that causes the explosion. Same with the Big Bang Theory. That you, you know, that's why Einstein was found it difficult to accept the Big Bang Theory. He didn't want to believe in it because he knew, therefore, that if it's true, then the universe had a beginning in a moment of time and that it was light. Not at all unlike Genesis chapter 1, verse 3. God said, let there be light, and there was light. That's what the Big Bang Theory was, an explosion of light from which everything else came into being. And who could do that? Who could set it off and set it off in such a perfectly orderly way that everything else that we live in exists. It's amazing, amazing. There would not even be subatomic particles unless that explosion had been desi designed with a certain precision of the speed of light, the rate of gravity, and a lot of other factors. Absolutely precise. And so this is why we need to rec recognize we refer to creation to God. And we, we see uh, also in God in Spez, paragraph 36, without the creator, the creature would disappear. When God is forgotten, the creature itself grows unintelligible. Now, that is a very profound thing. But think about it. Why would the creature become unintelligible if there's no creator. Very simple. Listen to the atheists. Very interesting group of people. Not always, sometimes very intelligent, but a lot of times educated beyond their intelligence. And they come up with theories that are not always that clever. For instance, They'll, one of the principles of atheism, well, the Big Bang was just an accident and the speed of light, the rate of gravity, and all the other constants of the universe that are precisely fine-tuned to one to, the, I think it's something like the hundred thousandth point, the decimal point. It's, 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 you know, I think that's even, no, it's way more than that. It's, yeah, I, I, I've got that back at home. But it's this incredibly precise variation that cannot, you cannot have uh, any uh, of these variations and the likelihood of this is extremely remote and so on. And that's all an accident. And then of course that life happened to form in some mud puddle on earth as the heat of the sun, you know, activated, you know, the various things that might be in the water and, and then from that came the origin of life and the single cells, and those single cells just happen to have within them the ability to reproduce. 
and spread everywhere. And from them came all the other complexities. And all that's just an accident. Whereas now, uh, and when you study single cell critters, you see they are extraordinarily complex. Inside a single cell is a great complexity. It's all an accident. And what I like to remind the atheist, if that's true, then your idea that everything is an accident is itself an accident. That, I mean, you were conditioned by your environment to think that you were conditioned by your environment. In other words, you apply their theory to their own theory. Oh, no, 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 this is objective science. This is really the way it is. It really happened that way. And you, no, no, this is science proves that I'm right. No, you're conditioned by your environment to think that this was a scientific experiment. And you're conditioned to be very defensive any time somebody applies your theory to your theory. Oh, no, you're crazy. You're just talking. No, see, that's your reaction, that you are conditioned by your environment to think I'm crazy for disagreeing with you. And no matter what they say, just keep on pointing out this is your reaction because you're conditioned by your environment. What does that mean? It means that I'm telling them they are completely unreasonable. If everything exists without God and there's no purpose to it, then there is no reason behind their reasoning. Their reasoning is no more sensible than worshiping a rock among the Aborigines in Australia. It's, the, you know, it's just in your environment made to do that. Your environment made you believe in science. But if you believe in God, who made you in his image and likeness, and who put an order and a reasonableness that is discoverable by reasonable minds who know how to use logic and science, and that we have that reason as the imitation and likeness of God, and that we are truly in his likeness, knowing how to make decisions, then the rest of this makes very good sense. That is why the great movements of science not all the discoveries, but the great movements of science come from the Christian West, far more than any other culture. And you have to go into the history of science to see more what I'm talking about. But the more you take a look at where the core of science comes from. In the um, various curricula, developed by the first school systems, which were developed by the church. The church invented the idea of a school system. Science and math were always at the core of it. That's why there are more craters on the moon named after Jesuits than any other group in the world. Why? Because the Pope asked them to run his astronomical uh, observatory, the Castel Gandalf, and we still do. He wanted them to study science. Oh, there's a little spat with Galileo, but that was because he made claims for which he had bad proof. I don't know if you realize this, his first proof for the, for the um, Earth going around the sun was that was the tides. Well, that's wrong. The tides don't prove that the earth goes around the sun. The tides indicate the rotation of the moon around the earth. So he had it wrong, and he was trying to make a claim beyond the evidence available to him. And he, you know, he lived in papal territory, and he kept making fun, not making fun, um, but yet he kept insulting the Pope for being a dope, 
for not agreeing with him. And the Pope didn't disagree with him, by the way. Neither did the Jesuits. They agreed. They just admitted we don't yet have the evidence to assert that this is absolutely true. We can't take science on faith in Galileo alone. We have to have observation and test the observation to make sure the science is true. And eventually, the, you know, it was proven, but in Galileo's day, it was still a theory, and you can't go around calling your sovereign, in his case, the Pope, bad names. In those days, uh, he only ended up under house arrest, by the way. Other people, other sovereigns who were insulted by the subjects uh, tended to have your head rest in a place different than your body. Uh, they were a little more rough in those days than we see politicians today. Today, politicians only start whining when you insult them. In those days, they cut off your heads. So it's, it's, I'd say it's an improvement, but um, not that I want to commend whining. As my mother said, stop it. I'll give you something to whine about. All right, we're going to take a break. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes. And we want to get some of your questions and your comments, so please stay with us. Thank you and welcome back. First of all, we want to invite you to come down here to uh, Sweet Home, Alabama and join us here in the studios and at Mass. Please contact our pilgrimage department. Their number is 205-271-2966 or you can go online to EWTN.com and find out from them information about the scheduling of Masses here at the network, the uh, times for programs that you can be in our studio audience, love to have you, and also uh, times um, or places where you can stay, uh, places to eat, now especially some of you folks from up north, you got to get you those fried green tomatoes now, come on. Uh, we've got the Irondale Cafe and we've got religiously themed restaurants here in town. We've got Golden Rule Barbecue. See, you always got to live by the golden rule, and the barbecue's good. So is the coleslaw. And also, uh, we've got hamburger heaven. Uh, so we'd love to have you come and share in the religious themes of the restaurants right here in beautiful Irondale, Alabama, or any other place that you want to go eat. And of course, they'll give you directions on how to get up to the Shrine of the Blessed Sacrament up in Hansville, where the sisters are. All right, I think we're ready with a caller. Hello, Patricia. Yes. Hi, where are you from? I'm from Chicago. What part of the city are you from? Right in the heart of the city. Where? Downtown. Downtown, okay. That's a pretty neat area down there. So, Beautiful. Yeah. So what is your question? My question is, how could the bread and wine that Jesus offered his disciples at the Last Supper, at the Last Supper, actually be his body and blood since he had not yet been crucified. Mm -hmm. And since he was still alive, it seems like this is more of a representation mm -hmm. than an actual fact. Yeah, st hold on there a second. Um, so, uh, I mean, don't, don't, don't hang up yet. Uh, a couple things. W one element of that is he makes it very clear that he says, this is my body and this is the cup. He doesn't use the word representation or represent or symbol of or anything like that. And one of the things about the ancient languages is that a lot of times you can communicate the verb to be, the word is in this case, without stating it. 
uh, a lot of times you form sentences without the verb, just state the uh, uh, object and the predicate object. But in the text uh, that we have in Greek, that it is explicitly using the word is in order to emphasize it. So you've got that to cope with. Secondly, this also brings in his divinity. Because of Christ's divinity, not only does he have the power to do what he says, again, remember that it's, he says that uh, at the, uh, uh, the beginning of John's gospel, that everything came to being through the Word, and the Word was made flesh. And that power of Christ is not only the power to use his word to make things happen, something he did throughout the whole public ministry. He would speak a word and the deaf could hear, the uh, blind could see, the leper was healed, the dead were raised. His word had that effect. So that's a second issue. But a third issue is also related to his divinity, is that in his divine nature, Jesus is timeless. He's eternal, not the relative eternity we have. We have only relative eternity because our soul came into existence at a specific point in time, at our conception. And then it lives, lives forever after that. Whereas God has true eternity without beginning and without end. And therefore, because he has true eternity, he is also timeless. He is, the, the eternal means to be that he's not limited by time. And so the, the time sequence that you see as a problem is something that his eternal divine nature overcomes. That's also one of the reasons, as a matter of fact, no, that is the key reason that the Eucharist continues to be effective because his eternity transcends all time and place, so that the Eucharist is truly his body and his blood in every place and every time without any limit. And that applies also to the Last Supper. Does that help see some of that? Yeah, yes, that helps a lot. Good. All right. Well, that was easy enough. Let's take a question from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? Uh Holy Cross Parish in Batavia, Illinois. All right, not far from Chicago, just right, right around the uh, Iowa border, right? Yeah. No, not that far. Anyways, Father, what, what I'm interested in is how do we, as just ordinary Catholics uh, striving to do the right thing, deal with our other people who are sitting in the pews besides us, 40 to 50 percent of whom are voting for the pro-abortion candidates and the pro-abortion party? Right. How do we do this without being judgmental and, and all that and leading people to the truth? You know, this is something that uh, is a, a difficult situation, but it's not as difficult as it once was. Already, the tide is turning against the pro-abortion group for a variety of reasons. One of them is a lot of young people are beginning to realize my, perhaps my siblings, my cousins, or the people that would have been my friends have been aborted. Young people are, are alert to that, and some of them are even sensing that they have been survivors of that. And they're realizing that this is something that is not right because of the absence of their peers. Secondly, we also see, uh, as a matter of fact, just today, yet another one of the videos showing that Planned Parenthood is harvesting the organs of aborted 
babies and selling them. Now, they keep changing the story. Now, we're not getting a straight story. Well, I don't know if they're changing it, but they're certainly not giving the same story twice. So that you see on one video that a woman wants to buy a Lamborghini based on the sale of baby body parts. Un but then the, another woman who's in charge of Planned Parenthood says, oh, we only cover costs. We don't make a profit. But then today's video sh shows that they are saying they do make a profit. And, you know, uh, this is something that we can point out to our, our friends that the problem with this is you are seeing a desensitization that has gone on for these children. And, you know, there are a lot of people talking about correctly that black lives matter. And now they're incorrect when, they, when somebody says all lives matter. Why not? That's absurd. But even by their principle, you can apply it here because Planned Parenthood, I've said it many times, 60% of their abortion clinics are in African American neighborhoods. Even though African Americans are only 12% of the population. Can we talk here about targeting a certain group of people? And what we're seeing is that they are selling the parts of a lot of blood. Disproportionately high number of African American babies are having their body parts sold. And it is horrible to think that we used to sell African Americans and buy them as slaves at one point. But now it's taking them apart and selling them by pieces. And this horrible reality is where we're not being judgmental of our friends, but we're saying this reality is going on in America now. And this is one of the results. Now, when you poke around, by the way, with that large number of people, 40 to 50 percent of Catholics who say that they'll, they'll vote for a pro-abortion politician and such, most of the time, as a matter of fact, what you hear is that they are uh, they're willing to allow abortion in the case of rape and incest. That accounts for about 1% of abortions. So that means, and this is a good thing to point out to them, you are against 99% of abortions that go on today because they are not the result of rape or incest. Though again, as I've said many times, I would add this. If you caught the rapist, would you crush his skull, cut off his arms and legs, and, as they're doing, harvest his organs and sell them. Would you do that? Of course not. Our Constitution, Bill of Rights, prohibits cruel and unusual punishment. We don't want to do that to the perpetrator. If you don't do it to the perpetrator, don't do it to the baby who is as much a victim of that rape or act of incense as is the mother. Help them to think through this and see the logic of the horror of the abortion industry. And that may help them to think differently. It's not just that we want them to be emotional one way or the other, but to think through the issue, and that would be my suggestion. We have Kathy on the line. Hello, Kathy. Hi, Father. Hi, how are you I've doing? Been I've been listening to your lectures on relativism 
and begin to think about uh, where some of the errors in my life have come from and the teachings of the priest in my life during the 60s era. And Sunday, our you priest sound like a kid a my age. Indicative, indicative of the teachings that we were taught as I grew up. And he was talking about the fishes and the loaves. It were not really a miracle, as stated, but merely a sharing of food that the people brought with them because they traveled so far. Right. And I feel that this statement was an error because I believe in God and the Holy Spirit, our Lord Jesus mm -hmm. Christ, divine mercy, and Fatima. Right. What do you think about this teaching? Oh, I think it's as dumb as a box of rocks. Yeah, yeah. And uh, let me give you an example. Why? Think about this, Kathy. If I'm sitting there listening to Jesus teach for two, three, four, five hours, and all of a sudden, everybody's hungry. And they say, wait a minute. Everybody share what you have. And all of a sudden, these people say, oh, yeah, I've had this tuna fish sandwich under my arm for the last six hours. You want some? <laughs> no, thanks. If our Lord was trying to communicate that he was going to get people to share, he would have said so. This theory is not new from the priest. It comes from about 1810, 1815. There was a German scholar, I, 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 I don't recall for sure, but I think it might have been Reimarus. Um, and he came up with that theory because in the Enlightenment period of philosophy, he wanted to make the gospel sound more rational. That was his goal. And so he came up with that explanation. There was another scholar, and I might have had these, these guys mixed up, but he said, well, Jesus did the miracles for sure, but all he did is have a medical bag, and nobody else in those days understood medicine, so they thought it was a miracle, but it was really just medicine. No, no, honey, they knew about doctors and medicine. The Roman medical in this uh, or, or, or establishment was well well known and effective. They, they could do a lot of things, not as much as today, but they could do a lot of things. So, you know, they knew the difference between doctors doing healings versus miracles. They knew the difference between sharing your old uh, tuna fish sandwich from under your armpit for the last five or six hours versus uh, multiplying loaves and fish in front of you and having 12 baskets left over. I mentioned that interpretation once to the Bishop of Nazareth. And I said, this is what some priest is saying. I didn't say I do, because I don't, but I agree with you. And the Bishop said, he just took his fist and slammed it. He said, Abuna, that, uh, that's Arabic for father. He said, Abuna, these people do not know us. If I have ten children and one piece of bread and a man comes to my house, he will eat and we will go hungry. In other words, the idea in the Middle East that you would not share readily and that somebody has to make you share is so contrary to the culture. They love to share their food and they'll let you eat rather than themselves. That's, that's the culture. And, our, you know, what we see is something totally different. What I might suggest is that perhaps that scholar or some other people who had, in fact, some of those scholars had a certain anti-Semitic attitude. And they might have been projecting their own selfishness onto the ancient Jewish people where it was not part of their culture. That's just a little suggestion. Ma'am, where are you from? Yes, I'm from New Jersey and Florida. Good to see you. Welcome here. Good to have Thank you. Thank you. And what is your question? I recently read an article in the Catholic newspaper regarding the devil being rampant in the world and in the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. uh, an exorcism is being considered. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your thoughts regarding this? Well, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't know uh, of how rampant. I, I certainly, 
I certainly do sense that there is uh, a lot of movement of evil in our world. And it's not just because people disagree with me or something. That's not the point. It's we, we look at the way that, um, uh, for instance, I'll give you a good example. The recent Supreme Court decision making same-sex marriage acceptable by our law, okay? Do people then say, okay, we got this right, and now you, know, you go and do your thing, we'll do ours? Is that what's going on? No. So that we now have somebody who's going a next step and saying he is suing the publishers of Bibles for $70 million dollars because the Bible says things critical of homosexual acts. So you see that it's not just that, well, you got what you asked for. No, I want to stop you from even disagreeing with me and printing a book so that your freedom of religion, your freedom of speech, and your freedom of the press are not as important as how I feel when you criticize my sexual behavior. That doesn't sound like it's coming from the good spirit at all. And we see, you know, I think we have to pay attention to the quality of discourse. The president was talking about how the quality of discourse politically is getting worse and worse. You take a look at the level of violence. I mean, what, what would induce somebody to go to a theater and start shooting people? Go into a church and start shooting people. This is, this is not from God. This is from an evil spirit. And you will not stop it by taking away people's guns. You might be wise to, that if somebody is involuntarily hospitalized for mental disorder, not letting them get a gun. I agree with that. And that should have been done in this case the, of the theater in Lafayette, Louisiana. But, you know, if you take away everybody's guns, will that stop the fact that the same week another person stabbed to death? five members of his family, you can take away all the knives. He also used a hatchet on one of his family members, you can take away all the hatchets. Where, where can you stop? There is instead something of people being open to evil. And there is a, a, a demonstrable evil. You know, our, our Savior Jesus said it well in John 8, excuse me, John 10, that Satan is a liar from the beginning, and is the father of lies and a murderer. When we see ISIS in, in the Middle East killing children because they didn't do fast during Ramadan. In the Islamic theology, um, small children are exempt from the Ramadan fast. When little kids ate something, they killed them. I mean, that is from the evil, the evil one. And such kind of killing of innocence comes from the evil one. This is something I think we do need. As a matter of fact, I, I think in Latin America, one of the countries, might have been Colombia or something, they did a national exorcism. And some people are talking, uh, written to me about that. Uh, we could do that here, but you know, it might be good to start off with our local dioceses to begin exercising, and there's some places that if I had one of those airplanes that puts out forest fires, I'd like to fill it up with holy water <laughs> and start circling some of our cities <laughs> high up so it's a fine mist that gets everywhere. You don't want to just dump it like you would on the fire, but just circle. So that, that's some sense. Sir, where are you from? Hello, Father. I'm from Detroit. Yes. <laughs> hmm. Yes. What, what do you, what's your question? Um, just being in the news recently, um, Detroit 
there's a group there now that erected a satanic statue there. Yeah, um, to perform it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in the name of religious freedom. Yeah. Um, so what should we do as Catholics about this kind of stuff coming in the media and in our cities now? Absolutely. Good, good question. Well, there again, in the name of religious, not in the name of religious freedom, but as an act of religious freedom, that would be a good example to do what this lady's talking about. Call for, I already know that there were masses of reparation that were offered in Detroit during the time they were doing that ceremony, right? And there says they did that when a satanic mass was offered at an auditorium in Oklahoma City, that a mass of reparation was offered. They had taken a host illegitimately from a Catholic mass and were going to desecrate it during the satanic mass. The bishop you know, stood up and said, look, you can't do that, and the court supported him. I think what we can, you know, a religious freedom allows them to do that, okay? And that, that's, that's the law. But we also have religious freedom to pray that, you know, to, to, to an exorcism, to bind the forces of evil, to bind those evil spirits, put an end to them. And, you know, I, you know every time, you know, uh, when I'm driving on the express interstate and things like that, and I see these signs for adult, these aren't adult stores. There's nothing adult about them. They, they are s- s- stores that use adult as a euphemism for licentious stores. That's what they ought to call themselves. We are licentious stores. And I always pray that the Lord Jesus bind the spirits of lust, that hook into people's lives in places like that. We need, you know, as we pass by abortion clinics and any other place where evil is being perpetrated that we know of, do that. You know, pray to bind the spirits of deception. I've done that in a number of places. And, you know, some of them no longer exist. I had nothing to do with it <laughs> except praying. But the, I remember there was one area uh, filled with these adult places, so-called. Um, every one of them burned down. And again, I really didn't do anything about it, but uh, I certainly, except pray, to bind the spirits of lust in those places. We have another question. Young man, where are you from? Um, Missouri. And your question? What did all the saints and Mary see would be a good question, well, would be a good thing to say okay. to all the people who don't really believe in faith. Okay. Good question. You know, one of the things you can do is take a look at some of the things, for instance, at Fatima. That lady mentioned Fatima earlier. Um, that when the Blessed Virgin spoke at Fatima. She warned, for instance, that if people didn't stop committing so many sins, that a war that was even worse than the one going on, it was during World War I in 1917, about a year and a half away from its end, or just over a year from its end, that she said a worse war would come and it would be a sign in the sky. Well, in January of 1938, the aurora borealis was seen as far south as North Africa, and within uh, six weeks of that, the uh, Nazis invaded Austria and the next Austria, and the war was in its process going on. So you can say she said it was going to happen, and it did. So now let's learn to listen. That would be a good thing to say. But a good thing for me to say is, we've run out of time. So may the Lord bless you and keep you, cause His face to shine upon you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And again, I want to remind you that this network is brought to you by you. You make it possible for us, so we ask you,
to please keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill. As one man said, I, I can't even afford anything because I have nothing left. But his prayers, you at least pray for us and help us out as you can, especially in these summer months. God bless you and thank you.